So after showing us the high possibilities that are hidden within us, now Shaobindo is contrasting with those glimpses that we get of our higher possibilities. The ordinary earth consciousness as it's been developed in the course of evolution. And we had that picture of the, the earth mother toiling across the sands of time and the coiling of her path and then the things that have evolved in her wake. Mm. So it is earth consciousness. It's the he calls her the earth goddess, the earth goddess. It's the consciousness of the earth. But of course, it's the consciousness of the earth that is expressed in us. No? We have the, her, her consciousness has passed through uh, almost total inconscience of matter. And then there's been the life world has developed, which he describes very, very beautifully later on in the poem. And uh, now there's a mental consciousness, but he says it is, um, it doesn't see very clearly to our waking mind's small moment look. A goalless voyage seems our dubious course. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere in particular to our ordinary mental consciousness. And he's been explaining to us how there's this yearning within the earth goddess for this pure perfection that she needs. She craves a faith that can survive defeat. The sweetness of a love that knows not death. The radiance of a truth forever sure. Is that where we stopped? Hmm? Yeah? Oh, a bit further. Okay, I'm starting to read from line 196 on page 51. A change comes near that flees from her surmise and ever postponed compels attempt and hope yet seems too great for mortal hope to dare. A vision meets her of supernal powers that draw her as if mighty kinsmen lost, approaching with estranged great luminous gaze. Then is she moved to all that she is not, and stretches arms to what was never hers, outstretching arms to the unconscious void. Passionate she prays to invisible forms of gods, soliciting from dumb fate and toiling time what most she needs, what most exceeds her scope. A mind unvisited by illusion's gleams. A will expressive of soul's deity. A strength not forced to stumble by its speed. A joy that drags not sorrow as its shade. For these she yearns and feels them destined hers. Heaven's privilege she claims as her own right. 
heart. Just is her claim, the all-witnessing gods approve. Clear in a greater light than reason owns. Our intuitions are its title deeds. Our souls accept what our blind thoughts refuse. Earth's winged chimeras are truth steeds in heaven. The impossible God's sign of things to be. But few can look beyond the present state or overleap this matted hedge of sense. All that transpires on earth and all beyond are parts of an illimitable plan the one keeps in his heart and knows alone. Our outward happenings have their seed within. And even this random fate that imitates chance, this mass of unintelligible results, are the dumb graph of truths that work unseen. The laws of the unknown create the known. The events that shape the appearance of our lives are a cipher of subliminal quiverings which rarely we surprise or vaguely feel, are an outcome of suppressed realities that hardly rise into material day. They are born from the spirit's sun of hidden powers, digging a tunnel through emergency. But who shall pierce into the cryptic gulf and learn what deep necessity of the soul determined casual deed and consequence? Absorbed in a routine of daily acts, our eyes are fixed on an external scene. We hear the crash of the wheels of circumstance and wonder at the hidden cause of things. Yet a foreseeing knowledge might be ours if we could take our spirits stand within, if we could hear the muffled demon voice. I'll pause there. Which way are we going today? Sorry, shall I start this side? Last week you weren't here. Martin, you begin, huh? A change comes near that flees from her surmise and ever postponed compels attempt and hope. It seems too great for mortal hope to dare. Mm. There is a change coming, but she can't grasp, she can't guess what that change is going to be and how it can happen. Surmise is when you think something might happen like this or like that. You don't know, but you have a guess. It could be this, 
but it might be something quite different. And that change seems to be ever postponed. It's as if there's a promise, but it doesn't get fulfilled. But just that promise is so appealing that it compels attempt and hope. The earth consciousness feels that an effort must be made and there is a hope there. And yet that change seems too great for mortal hope to dare, for the hope that we human beings subject to death have. No? How short our lives are. And it's such a great change that we are longing for and that we are promised. Um, are we ever going to see it? No? Mila. A vision needs uh, of supernal powers that draw them uh, as if mighty kinsmen lost, approaching with a strange, great, luminous gaze. Read them. Then, yes, go on. Yes, go on, please, Mila. Then is she moved? Then is she moved to all that she is not, and stretches arms to what was never hers. Yes. So she, the earth consciousness does get a glimpse of vision of higher powers, very high powers. Here we have the powers of matter, of life, of mind. But there are much higher powers. And the earth consciousness feels attracted towards those greater powers, as if she's uh, becoming aware of relations, close relations, who are very powerful and noble and whom she has lost. She's not in touch with them. But now with this promise, it's as if they are coming closer to her. They are looking at her with their great luminous gaze. They are mighty kinsmen, but they've been estranged for a long time. We hear about stories like this, you know, that of uh, children, twins, or maybe just siblings who are separated at a very early age and circumstances don't allow them to meet but then perhaps uh, when they've grown up, one or the other of them sets out to find the other or it happens by accident. You know? And then there's a great feeling of happiness that that estrangement, that separation has been overcome. So it's as if that's what is promised or part of the promise. So then she feels such a strong aspiration. Then is she moved to all that she is not. Earth is the material principle. No? These are supernal powers on a much higher level. And yet she feels attracted, aspires to be in contact with them. She stretches arms to what was never hers, experiences and knowledge that she has never had. Uh, Bhuvana. All stretching homes to the unconscious void, passionate she prays to invisible forms of God, soliciting from dumb fate and toiling time. What moves she needs, what moves exceed her scope, a mind unvisited by illusions beings, a way expressive of soul's deity, a strength not forced to stumble by its feet, a joy that drags not sorrow as its shape. Yes. 
also when she's moved like that, attracted by all that she is not, and she starts praying for these things that have ne she's never experienced. It's as if she stretches the earth, there she is, our planet rolling in space, uh, surrounded by this unconscious void, emptiness. Uh, but we have a feeling that that's where the higher powers are. Human beings have, as long as we know about, they have stretched arms, lifted up their eyes to the heights, no. praying to forms of gods that she can't see, soliciting, praying for, begging for, imploring from dumb fate and toiling time. These are the circumstances in which we earth creatures live. No. Our lives are, seem to be determined by something like destiny or fate that we can't influence, and by the passage of time. And for us, it's toiling time, because all of Earth life involves effort, toil, hard labor. So what she's praying for is what she needs most, and what is most out of her reach, exceeds her scope, it's beyond what she can reach. And Sri Aurobindo gives a list. She needs a mind which is not troubled by the false lights of illusion, a mind unvisited, by illusions, gleams, misleading lights. She needs a will that is able to express the divinity of the soul within. Our mental will is very rarely capable of expressing the divine truth of the soul. That's so much needed, a will that can express the divine will of the soul within. She needs a strength that's not forced to stumble by its speed. We do sometimes have very passionate urges that give us strength and drive us very uh, powerfully towards certain aims and goals. But when we go quickly towards something that we want to achieve, very often we bang our foot and we stumble. We fall down on the way or we damage ourselves. And he says, this strength of the earth, actually when it moves fast, it's forced to stumble. It can't help it. And the other thing that she needs is a joy that does not drag sorrow as its shadow. For us, we can hardly separate these things. No? They seem to be uh, two inseparable uh, things. If there's joy, there's bound to be sorrow. We rarely remember that if there's sorrow, there's also bound to be joy. No, but these two things seem to go together. When she tells, when she pray invisible God, for example, I give you my personal example. I pray God like me. He helped me a lot in my life, in my life. When I pray God at me, Agni is divine will. Hello, I pray for divine will, help mm. me. But uh, he is a very, very mixed. Hello, 
You, you pray to Agni. Yeah. Yes, so that's a very good thing to pray to, no? Isn't that the first line in the Rig Veda? Agni, be the priest of our sacrifice. No? That, that it, because Agni is that flame of aspiration and energy which is always pointing upwards, which gives us strength and leads us towards the truth. So these gods have forms. We can imagine Agni in the form of a flame or a being made of flames, but they are invisible to our mortal eyes. No? But uh, it's very, very, uh, for example, maybe invisible eyes don't see, but the inside. Yes. Sometimes the presence. Yes. Right. Divine presence. Automatically, everything is divine. But uh, it's very, very. Wow. And I show my action or my what I do is uh, I don't understand. But is uh, I am sure is uh, exactly what I do. <laughs> But my mind interferes because Agni is connected with will. Yeah. No? It's so this is the, the will that can express the divinity of the soul. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, page 16 and 17 at the end also, the same thing is in everything. But joy cannot endure until the end. Mm. There is a darkness in terrestrial thing that will not suffer long to glad emotion. Yes. So this is our earthly condition, no? There's this darkness in earthly things that's holding us back. We would like to take off <laughs> to happier spheres, but uh, there's something that doesn't allow us to be really happy for very long. And that's so, even with divine beings, like Savitri, any avatar, when they incarnate, they accept that darkness of terrestrial things, that they can't enjoy the same bliss which they have, which the soul has on the higher levels. That's why the souls that come to earth are considered to be his heroic souls, because they accept, they choose, that yes, we will go and we will experience that adventure of unconsciousness and suffering in order to participate in the forward movement. Hmm? We've got all these nice Buddha's paintings at the four to five Buddha's paintings. Uh, yes, now here actually for these, uh, this section, um, the mother has sketched for Huta, the, the sketches are there. Um, I think it's a series of 12 uh, successive pictures. It's like a little comic strip, starting from the earth goddess, toiling through the sands of time, and uh, then the earth itself, and a light growing in her, and then this, uh, the stretch outstretching arms, and so on. Actually, the series continues till the end of the section on page 55. So as you go out, you can have a look at those. Especially mother's sketches are very interesting. But uh, suddenly coming in my mind, but Agni also is the immortal in the mortal. Right. When it takes the yes. physical body. Yes. <laughs> That's why even in the earth principle, even in the earth goddess, there is this longing, this uh, aspiration, this craving even, he says, you know, for a higher experience and power of expression. And that's what's driving evolution forward. So let's go back to the text. Um, top of page 52, Supo. For this, she yearns and feeds them, destined earth. Heavens, we believe, 
she climbs with her own life. Just is her climb the all witnessing goes up to clear in a greater light and reason only. Our intuition or its title deeds. Our soul accepts what our blind thought refuses. Yes. So earth is yearning for this mind, this will, this strength, this joy. And she feels, we all feel somewhere in us, that these things are our right. We should have them. Hmm? She feels that she is destined to have them. She claims the privilege of heaven, of the higher levels of consciousness, as her own right. I should have these things, she says. And the all-witnessing gods, the universal powers who are watching everything, they approve, they agree, they say yes, her claim is just, she should have all those things. She has a right to all those things. That right is absolutely clear in a greater light than our reason has. Our reason is a kind of light and uh, our reason tells us nonsense. You can't have those things. How do you think that you, a mere mortal, can have them? But that higher light says the very fact that you can imagine or dream of and aspire for having these things is a proof that you are meant to have them. That is what Shobindo writes in the very first chapter of The Life Divine. He speaks of the human aspiration and he says, uh, our intuitions are the title deeds, the proof of our right to have these higher things, truth, light, immortality, God. They are clear in a greater light than reason owns. And in that whole book, Sri Aurobindo is giving us, showing us in that greater light, convincing our reason <laughs> that uh, these things not only should be ours, but will be ours. Our intuitions are its title deeds. And our souls accept our souls know what our blind thoughts refuse and say, oh, vain dreams, impossible, forget it. Mm. Are, are there certain conditions attached to that? <laughs> well, the condition is growth, it's progress. Mm. No. It's not rewards and punishment. Mm. These things are coded into the the material evolution from the very beginning, the material universe from its very beginning, whether the beginning was a big bang or a great orb, we don't know, but it contained within it all these future possibilities. So we have to pass through toiling time, and we have to grow in the light, and especially in this canto, Shorabindo will be explaining to us why and how that is so. Uh, who's next? Avantika. Would you read? Uh, how many lines? Uh, we usually read to the full stop. Okay. Earth's wind. Earth's wing chimeras are things seeds in heaven, the impossible God's sign of things to be. But few can look beyond the present sea or overlap this matted hedge of sense. Go on. Okay. All that transpires on earth and all beyond are parts of an inimitable plan. The one 
keeps in his heart and knows alone. Yes. So there's this mysterious line, Earth's winged chimeras are truth's steeds in heaven. Chimeras are creatures in Greek mythology and we use the word in our modern language to, uh, to mean something impossible, a chimera, an idle fancy. In Greek mythology it is a, a creature with a, a lion's body and wings and uh, maybe there's part of a goat as well. It's one of these composite animals. And of course these composites are symbolic. But what here Sri Aurobindo is saying, that uh, what seemed to us on earth idle fancies, vain imaginations, wishful thinking, on the higher levels of existence, they are the steeds, the horses on which the truth rides. Truth steeds in heaven. And he tells us the impossible, the things that we think are impossible, are actually God's signs. He's showing us things that are meant to be in the future. But few of us can look beyond the present state. There's a part in us which looks at the present state, the physical realities, and doesn't believe that anything can ever really be fundamentally different. No. Few of us can look beyond the present state. And few of us can leap over this matted hedge of sense. Our perceptions of the world around us come to us through our senses, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. The senses are keeping us, giving us data all the time about the world around us. And our mind interprets that data and uh, thinks, oh yes, table, chair, sweet-smelling flowers, beautiful view. It's very difficult for us to have another kind of experience that's not dominated by our physical senses. So it's one of the things that aspiring yogis are told to do. First to silence the mind, and then if you try to silence your mind, you become immediately very conscious of all the sense impressions that are disturbing you. You have to be able to detach yourself from the sense experiences. Only then you be can begin to get some real inner experience. So few can overleap this matted hedge. It's as if we're surrounded by a, a very thick, thorny hedge of all the self sense impressions, and we just can't get beyond it to see what is on the other side. Is that where you stopped, Avantika? Yeah? Uh, I think so. One more, one more sentence, yes. So everything that happens on Earth and everything that happens beyond the Earth in the rest of the material universe and in the subtle worlds, it's all part of one huge plan, a plan without limits. And the One, the Supreme, the Lord, the One is keeping that plan in His heart and He's the only one who knows all its details. Yeah. Dana Lakshmi. Our router happens at the sea between. And even this random change that imitates chance this mass of unintelligible muscles or the dumb crack of food that what I see. The laws of the unknown create the known. Yes. 
So everything that happens to us outwardly, have, everything has grown from a seed that is within us. Hmm? And even this random fate that imitates chance, things seem to happen to us for no reason at all, just by chance, randomly. And this mass of unintelligible results, things happen, they seem to have causes, but the results don't seem to match the causes. It's all very bewildering and puzzling, unintelligible. We can't make sense of it. In fact, he says, they are the dumb graph of truths that work unseen. You know what a graph is, no? It's a kind of diagram from which we can read information. But it's not a picture, it's not an image, it's a diagram. And uh, very often it takes the form of uh, a matrix with uh, two dimensions and dots here and there. And a person who knows how to read the, the graph can know what are the relations between these pot, spots and what the graph is telling. So he says this is a dumb graph. It's not expressing itself very clearly, but this is a, a graph of truths that are working unseen. We don't see the truths that are working behind. We just see these dots on the graph and we can't join them up to make sense out of them. But what is known, what happens to us, what we know, what we see, is determined by the laws of the unknown that we don't know about. Uh, Joel. The events that shape the appearance of our lives are a cipher of subliminal quiverings, which rarely we surprise or vaguely feel, are an outcome of suppressed realities that hardly rise into material day. They are born from the spirit's sun of hidden powers, leading a tunnel to emergency. Yes. The events that shape the appearance of our lives, apparently chance happenings, or we may see some kind of logic in them. He says they're a cipher, a code language. Hmm? And we don't know the code, so we can't decipher it. But what they, this code is telling us about is things that are going on quiverings, small movements that are subliminal, happening below the threshold of our consciousness. And only very rarely we become aware of those small inner movements. We only feel them very vaguely. But though the outer events are an outcome, a result of realities, things that are very real, but these realities are suppressed. They're only partly expressed through these outward events. Hmm? Those suppressed realities, with difficulty, they can express a little of themselves in our material day in the light of our physical consciousness. Those things that can express themselves are born, he says, from a kind of process. The spirit's sun, the sun is the symbol of light and energy, power, the spirit, sun of hidden powers, 
digging a tunnel through emergency. Underground, this sun is digging a tunnel and it's going to emerge fully into the light and all kinds of things will happen. It's digging a tunnel through emergency. Usually when we use this word, we think of the emergency room at the hospital or, you know, there's an emergency, quick, quick, we have to do something about it. But in French, this word, I think, is used also in the sense of things that are emerging. So there, there are a lot of things that are emerging and through them the spirit sun is digging this tunnel so that they can emerge into the light of material day. Shall we stop there for today? You want to read a little more, a little further? Hmm? Okay, let's read a little further. Who's next? Howard. The illusion peers into the cryptic gulf and learn what deep necessity of the soul determined casual deed and consequence. Yeah. Who has the consciousness to be able to look into this mysterious gulf of the subliminal, cryptic, means puzzling, secret. Hmm? Who will, can look into that and learn, find out what deep necessity of the soul has determined all these casual things that we do and then their consequences. You know, we just do things like that without thinking about it. We don't realize that they have their seed within and something has uh, made them happen and determined also the consequence of them. But the subliminal has everything because it's knowledge and uh, we contact everything. We, we can. The thing about the subliminal is that we can contact it. There are things that are subconscious or unconscious but the subliminal, the, the limen is the threshold. So there's a kind of threshold between the subliminal, between the inner mind, the inner life being, the inner physical being, and this outer being. And the subliminal is in contact with the universal forces. So it contains much, much more than what we can contain in our waking surface consciousness. And we can come into contact with the subliminal. Sometimes it happens in meaningful dreams, or if we go into a deep concentration, or it may just happen like that. We don't know why we get a, a deep, uh, deep insight into ourselves or into things. And that subliminal being is guiding us much more than we think. We do things uh, instinctively without being conscious why we are doing them. And of course there's some quite dangerous things in the subliminal also. They may un influence us as well. So. Who's going to pierce into that mysterious, deep place, that deep state of consciousness, and find out what deep necessity of the soul determined casual deed and consequence? You might uh, one day uh, just go a different way to work or out shopping or something. And then you meet just the person you were meant to meet. Or something happens to you which becomes very meaningful in your life. 
And we don't realize that there, oh, there was some inner guidance at that moment. Perhaps afterwards we might realize. And as we get older, we may look back across our lives and see, oh, that thing, I thought it was such a disaster. What a blessing it was. It has shaped wonderful things in my life. So we will stop there. Those who want to read can stay. Hundred and ninety six. A change, yes. A change comes near that flees from her surmise and ever postponed compels attempt and hope yet seems too great for mortal hope to dare. A vision meets her of supernal powers that draw her as if mighty kinsmen lost approaching with estranged great luminous gaze then is she moved to all that she is not and stretches arms to what was never hers. Outstretching arms to the unconscious void, passionate she prays to invisible forms of gods, soliciting from dumb fate and toiling time what most she needs, what most exceeds her scope. A mind unvisited by illusions gleams, a will expressive of soul's deity, a strength not forced to stumble by its speed, a joy that drags not sorrow as its shade. For thee she yearns and feels them destined hers, heaven's privilege she claims as her own right. Just is her claim, the all-witnessing gods approve, clear in a greater light than reason owns. Our intuitions are its title deeds, our souls accept what our blind thoughts refuse. Earth's winged chimeras are truth's steeds in heaven. The impossible, God's sign of things to be. But few can look beyond the present state or overleap this matted hedge of sense. All that transpires on earth and all beyond are parts of an illimitable plan the one keeps in his heart and knows alone. Our outward happenings have their seed within, 
And even this random fate that imitates chance, this mass of unintelligible results, are the dumb graph of truths that work unseen. The laws of the unknown create the known. The events that shape the appearance of our lives are a cipher of subliminal quiverings which rarely we surprise or vaguely feel are an outcome of suppressed realities that hardly rise into material day. They are born from the spirit sun of hidden powers, digging a tunnel through emergency. But who shall pierce into the cryptic gulf and learn what deep necessity of the soul determined casual deed and consequence. 